I'm One Mind Dogs coach Nikki Drage. I'm from Australia. I've been competing in agility for 20 years now and teaching for 10 of those. And one of the most common questions I get asked is how do I know which techniques to use on course and when? So that inspired me to hold this webinar. Um, the One Mind Dogs method is all about understanding your dog's perspective and letting that uh, guide your training and your life together with your dog. So with that in mind, the four steps that we're going to be discussing in this webinar are also based on how your dog sees and reads the agility course um, and your body language as well. So these are the four steps that we're going to be talking about. So the handling techniques, knowing your team, the lines and the critical points of the course and the balance between speed and accuracy. So firstly, I really want to talk about the One Mind Dogs handling techniques. So we have 30 different handling techniques and a lot of people think, wow, that's a lot. Like, why are there so many? Um, and it's really an option to suit every single type of uh, team. So every different kind of dog, faster dogs, slower dogs, high drive, low drive and every type of handler. So we have some handlers that even just walk the whole course um, or they're not able to turn their head or their neck or they can't um, turn their feet properly because they have something with their knees. So there's so many different like types of people in agility and people who love to run really fast, people who don't. So we wanted to have an option to give every kind of team a solution to any kind of thing that they might see on the course. And that's why there are so many techniques, because there's a lot of different things that can happen on a course and a lot of different kinds of people. But the good thing is your dog actually already knows most of the One Mind Dog's handling techniques. So 20 of them are completely natural to your dog. And the reason for that is because when Janita Lenanen, who this photo is of, when she founded One Mind Dogs and developed the techniques, she basically just tested uh, with her dogs and her students' dogs what happens if I turn this way? What happens if I run and slow down? What happens if I look here? And then basically took notes and learned from the dogs how they react in certain situations and then developed the techniques based on that and then tested it with lots of different kinds of dogs. So if your dog has strong foundation skills, um, then all of the handling techniques will feel very easy. And quite often at a seminar, I will uh, grab somebody else's dog and run through a technique to show how it works. And the dog will do it the first time. And people say like, how is that possible? But it really is just because the dog just naturally understands the body language when you get it right. Um, so really with One Mind Dogs, a lot of it is about your you learning and um, about learning how to use your body in a way your dog understands rather than teaching the dog. As long as the dog has those strong foundation skills, then um, it's all a lot more about the handler. So talking about why so many techniques, we already mentioned that the more tools that you have, the more solutions that you can create with those tools and solutions that really allow every kind of dog um, and handler team to succeed on the course. So I've got a little video that I'm already going to show you about this. So this is two of the One Mind Dogs founding coaches, Miko um, and Murray, and they train together and have very different kinds of dogs. And also they themselves are very different. So I'm just gonna pause it for a second and restart it because it just jumped ahead a little bit. Um, so you'll see here, this is Miko. Miko really likes to run. He's very fast and he's very good at turning on the spot quickly and keeping that connection with the dog. So he chooses the techniques that allow him to stay ahead and to create speed from the dog with him moving a lot. Um, and that's just, that's the way he really enjoys to run a course with his dog and communicate with his dog and feel like they're together on the course. So you can see he's pretty much always ahead and he moves out very quickly um, and is able to guide his dog through the course that way. And you'll see it again in slow motion. So you can see the kind of uh, handling techniques he chooses is to basically run on the dog's line a lot of the time ahead and a lot of dogs are very highly motivated by this type of handling so this kind of dog really loves that um i guess being in a race with you and um, his dogs are very used to him handling this way as well so they really thrive on it and then in comparison after miko you'll see murray and murray has a few physical restrictions and she really enjoys handling her dogs from a distance and she, right from the start she has trained very strong foundation skills with her kelpie um, this is Hugh, who we have Hugh's diaries on the One Mind Dogs um, platform, and it sort of shows you how she trained these skills from the beginning. But she handles everything from a lot of distance. She's very much off of the dog's line altogether. 
Um, so even though she handles the same course as Miko with the same method, it's completely different options of handling. She chooses completely different techniques that allow her to be calm um, and don't require her to move. And really it relies a lot more on the dog skill and a little bit less on um, her ability to run somewhere. So even though there are so many different handling techniques, the ones you choose will determine how you handle and what sort of handling signature that you have with your dog. And whether you prefer to teach the dog a few more skills so that it's more reliant on, on that, or whether you prefer to you yourself be everywhere and be controlling every part of the course, it's totally up to you and what you wanna do with your dog. Um, and I think both of them are really great to see and uh, there's nothing, absolutely nothing wrong with one or the other, not one is better than the other. It's just, again, what works for you and your dog. So you can see that um, there is a lot of different options <laughs> for sure. All right, let's go back to the slides. So another way to think about this is you could have just like one regular handsaw if you have a construction project. Let's say you want to build a house. If you have just a handsaw, it's going to take you a long time to build the house. You're not going to be very efficient. So let's compare that handsaw to a blind cross. And then you could have specific saws, so a drop saw, a chainsaw, a circular saw, that each have very specific jobs um, in your construction project. And if you use these specific tools for their jobs, you'll be a lot more efficient. And they could be compared to German turn, Japanese, Yakko turn. These are all different versions of blind crosses that have their own very specific applications on the course. Um, and at the moment, that might sound a little bit like a foreign language to some of you. That's totally normal um, because the more of these tools that you learn um, and practice and train with your dog, the more that you will be able to understand the language naturally. And eventually it will come to a point where it just becomes like, you know, someone says Japanese, you can picture exactly in your head what you're doing, what your dog is doing, where you would use that on the course and that sort of stuff. It doesn't happen overnight, but it does happen. And I have a lot of students that will suddenly say, oh, that clicked, like here I can do this. And I'll be like, yep, that's it, exactly. And we both know what we're talking about because we have taken these tools into our toolbox and practiced with them to a point where we know them thoroughly. So that's my very first point here is when you want to be able to choose handling techniques, you have to understand how each of them works. So each tool in your toolbox works with these different seven elements that we talk about. Um, in One Mind Dogs, that's each of our techniques are made up of those. And when you understand how each of those seven elements influence your dog on the course and what kind of line they create and why you use the seven elements in a certain way, you'll get a deeper understanding of that tool. And once you understand that tool, you will understand immediately where it's appropriate and where it's not. And so by just learning the handling techniques, you'll already have a very big hurdle of um, being able to decide what to use where. So really learn them in depth. Try not to just watch the video and go, oh, I'm going to try that and just go out and try it because then you won't understand why you're doing it or um, why certain things do and don't work in that technique. It's much better to study it in depth first yourself, practice it yourself, learn exactly why each of the points are the way they are, and then try putting it into a sequence with your dog. So once you understand those tools, you'll know already which ones to choose to get a certain job done. Let's say you have an S line on the course. You'll know, okay, these four techniques are appropriate for an S line. So then out of those ones, you have to choose what works best for your team. And that is all about learning about your team, which we'll talk about a little bit later on and learning what's appropriate for the two of you. But as you saw in that video, all teams will eventually have their favorite techniques and those become um, their signature basically. So their, their own personal handling style. And the more that they use those techniques, the better they become at executing them. And you might have six to 10 techniques that are in your toolbox that you use all the time. And then a couple that you'll use once, twice a year maybe. But just keeping all those tools sharpened and knowing how they all work means that you still have them there as options. So I've got some wise words from founding coach Yanita, which was basically that she says she always wanted to be able to confident, confidently do any of the techniques when needed without a fear of failing. So for example, the backlap is a technique that she's only used three times in her whole agility career. But what makes it special is the fact that two of those were very important competitions to her. 
One of them was World Championship team qualifications in Finland, and due to the fact that she had that backlap in her toolbox, she actually got a double win with two of her dogs on that course. So a well-rounded toolbox where you understand each of the techniques makes a huge difference when you go to walk a course, because you suddenly have so many solutions that you can choose from, and you'll know in each different context which ones suit your team. So let's get down to how do we choose which techniques to use where. Basically, one of the easiest way to do this is to start comparing techniques in different situations. So let's say we choose a common sequence that happens on uh, the high, like more advanced level courses, which is an S line. So it's where the dog comes like around the wing and then takes the jump and then also wraps the exiting wing. So you have sort of a tight exit, uh, tight S line where you're wrapping both the wings or a weaker, looser S line where you're sort of zigzagging a little bit. Um, and each of those have different handling options. So look at the dog's line in that si uh, specific situation and then choose the techniques that create those lines. And again, you'll be able to choose these techniques by learning them and knowing what they create. But also we are working on a resource this year that we'll be putting out um, where basically it shows you that in this line, these techniques are appropriate um, to give you that option to take that down to your course when you're walking the course and you can say, okay, yep, that matches that. So we're hoping that will be a great extra learning tool. Um, but you yourself can also do this. And I actually have students who have said, you know, go and look at these handling techniques on the One Mind Dogs website and draw for yourself the line that they're going to create for your dog. Because when you see it yourself and you draw it yourself, you pick up these things that you might otherwise miss by just watching videos. So taking notes like that are really, really helpful. So once you've chosen the techniques that can create that line, you will then compare those techniques in that situation by timing your performances. And it's quite important to time like a few obstacles before and a few obstacles after the technique, because that that the choice might affect the next three and the first like previous three obstacles. So make sure that you uh, compare the whole approach line and the whole exit line when you're timing them. Ideally, you, you want to use timing gates. If you don't have that, my suggestion is to video and then to analyze your video and look at the timestamps and use that for your timing. Um, that's my actually my preferred way. And there's a few different websites you can use to compare those as well. And then keep notes so that you learn about your dog. Okay, when this is the situation, these are the techniques that my dog prefers because blah. And then the more that you write these sort of notes, the more you get to know your dog and the easier it will be when you walk a course and you see a similar scenario, you can go, oh yeah, for my dog, this will work here. Now, one important thing is you can only compare the techniques once you can consistently, confidently perform them. There's no point in comparing a bad front cross with a really good blind cross, because of course the blind cross will win, because you're confident in that and you've created a good line for your dog with that. So make sure that you are just as confident in the two techniques that you're comparing before you compare them. And in the follow-up emails, I will have some examples um, of sort of sequences that you can use to compare techniques and which techniques to use in that sequence. But we can also have a look at this video that I have here from the One Mind Dogs Learning Platform. This is a bit of a cut out version of this next level episode, which is actually 20 minutes long, but I've just cut it down to like a minute, um, where you can see this course that um, One Mind Dogs coach Yako is working through with his students. And there's a lot of handling technique options on this, and you can see them trying a few different ones. So here we're comparing doing two wraps on this sequence with two slices with a slice and a wrap. And again, that you could have two or three different handling techniques to do that wrap. So she did a reverse wrap, you could do a flick, you could do a double lap turn, but these are all things that you will learn about your dog. And then here she's doing a twist followed by a German turn. So again, two different S line techniques, which again, don't worry if this all sounds like a foreign language to you. Um, because it is something that you will learn when you add the tools to your toolbox. So don't expect to know everything at this point already. Um, it will come. And here again is a different handler who is trying a wrap and a S line here yeah, option. So lots of different options on these kind of courses. And it's quite like common to walk a course and just go, oh, I'll do a wrap here because that's what you're co comfortable with. But when you start looking at a course more like, oh, I could do a wrap or a slice anywhere where there's a backside and you consider the different options and the dog's perspective when you're walking those options, then you'll suddenly have all this freedom of, of choices on the course. Um, and you will be able to know exactly which ones to choose once you know your dog and what works well for them. So each dog has different um, things that will suit them and you just never know like i quite often have a seminar where i will say all right we'll try this and for like 90 percent of people this will be the fastest 
um but for maybe a couple of you it won't so let's just try and then actually like the one that i thought would be slower is faster for some dogs because they're more motivated by that sort of handling for example um or they can collect and turn better so don't guess don't be like oh yeah that's the fastest line just try and time and you might be surprised so it might also be helpful for you to, to list what kind of line each technique creates so that you can compare them more easily. So you can say for a tight S line, I can do these techniques and then even maybe write notes about why. So for example, for German turn, you start on one side and then you change sides when you exit. Whereas on twist, it's the same line, but you stay on the same side the whole time. So by writing those sort of notes, you sort of learn, okay, when I need to be on this side, and then that side, I will choose this technique. So again, by writing these notes, you'll learn a lot more about the techniques and why we choose them. Uh, but again, we'll also be publishing a resource on this soon. So hopefully that will help you as well. So then next step, knowing your team and what works for you. So this is sort of broken down into three steps. So knowing your dog, knowing yourself, and making sure you don't compare your team to other teams. And that's super important. Um, so when it comes to knowing your dog, knowing their working distance, how close do they like to work to you? Do they prefer a technique where you're crossing their line and running on their line basically like a reverse wrap? Or do they prefer a technique where you're further away and they can handle the turn by themselves and they don't need you there, um, like a flick? So both reverse wrap and flick create the exact same line for the dog, but one you're um, running around with the dog and the other one you're sending the dog away from you. So basically you would know, okay, my dog doesn't wanna come close to me, so I would rather use a technique where I can send the dog away to do it themselves, or my dog is more motivated by chasing me around the wing, so I'll choose this. Uh, so that's a really important thing to know about your dog. And you can learn that by basically putting pressure on your dog's line and seeing at what point do they move away from you. Um, knowing where your dog is truly at right now. So not where you wish your dog was, um, but knowing exactly, okay, my dog right now is a little bit not that confident with, let's say, a backside. So I'm going to choose a technique that supports them a little bit more. Um, so really honoring where that dog is at the moment um, and then working on getting the skills to where you wish your dog was. Or maybe your dog is a little bit different than what you expected. So then going with what that dog is right now. And comparing handling options to learn your dog's natural reactions. So that's what I was saying. Even if you think that some line might be the fastest, let's just try anyway, because you'll be surprised. Some dogs much more motivated by a wrap, whereas others much prefer a slice. Um, some are right or left legged, so they are much tighter wrapping to the right, whereas they might be faster um, slicing to the left, for example. How easily do they uh, change their leading leg? So a slice involves more leading leg changes than a wrap generally, so maybe if they struggle a bit with lead changes, you might choose a wrap instead. Um, so learning that about your dog, and we have foundation exercises for that on the website, um, where you can teach your dog lead changes and really watch how they change leads. And then uh, some dogs get more confident when you're more connected and able to face them the whole time. Others prefer to see your back in a blind cross and chase you. So these are, again, things that you need to learn about your dog. And they're things you will learn by practicing these options. And then your dog's natural ability to turn or square up. Some dogs will naturally put a stride in if they have to go to the backside of the jump. They'll naturally put a stride in to square themselves up so that they jump more cleanly and comfortably. Other dogs will come around the wing and immediately jump when they see the bar. And those dogs will much more naturally slice. So I've got a little video on this too from Lynn, um, who has two of her dogs here running this uh, reverse wrap sequence. And you can see she handles them exactly the same way. And this is Stormy. And Stormy does not have the natural ability to square up. So you can see here she takes off as soon as she sees the bar. She's taken off right next to the wing. And she sort of jumps on a diagonal and lands on a diagonal. And then after landing has to make her turn and come around the wing. And this is a little bit harder on the dog's body. So this dog naturally chooses a slice. So maybe you would choose a slice for her on a course where the distance is about the same in a wrap or a slice because it's more natural, more comfortable for her um, and is better for her in the long run. Whereas Rain, you can see, takes off in the middle of the bar instead of next to the wing. So she ends up jumping square and has a much more comfortable landing and is already facing the new direction. So for her, you would choose a wrap because she naturally squares up um, and is able to wrap. And also when you're walking, of course, with um, a wrap where you're on the front of the wing, for her, you would probably allow herself to wrap while you move ahead. Whereas for Stormy, you might choose a reverse V set to shape her line and help her to wrap because she doesn't turn as naturally herself. So videoing your dog and knowing what their own 
capabilities are and then choosing handling based on that will make a really big difference. Um, also to your dog's longevity. So if you can create lines that are really comfortable for your dog, they will have less injuries and have more um, longevity in running courses basically. So then some wise words on this from Yako as well is that some dogs will naturally shape their approach to the obstacle like you saw uh, Rain doing. And these types of dogs don't need the handler to use, for example, the reverse V-set handling technique because they square up their line of approach on their own. So in general, small dogs benefit a bit less from these reverse V-sets um, and actually lose more time on the takeoff side from squaring up than they would ever gain on the landing side on a smooth exit. So if you know, okay, my dog squares up, then this is a technique I'm probably not going to be using most of the time because my dog can do that themselves and they won't gain enough benefit from me doing this technique. And you would keep that technique in your pocket just in case the dog, let's say, gets more confident and excited on the course and suddenly loses that ability to square themselves up. And I had a dog like that who suddenly got really fast and excited and started trying to run harder and beat me places. And then suddenly he didn't turn as well. So then I had to change which techniques I was using. So learning about your dog, but always being ready to keep learning, never stop learning. And we say that a lot, learning is infinite. Um, then knowing yourself. So do you have physical restrictions, for example, a back that doesn't allow you to turn or um, maybe your knees don't like it when you turn a lot. So then um, you will choose handling that feels easy for you and that becomes your signature. And we can always also adapt the handling. So for example, with uh, German turn, Murray, who you saw earlier with the Kelpie, she cannot rotate her chest to help her dog um, commit to the bar. So what she had to do was teach her dogs to, in the German turn, that whenever she does that, her dogs must take the bar regardless of what she does. By And this was taught by placing a lot of rewards on the dog's landing. So she had to teach extra skill, but it means that now she can handle in a way that doesn't restrict her physically. So there is always that option as well. Um, and then choosing where your effort is most required. So let's say there's a critical point on the course, which we'll talk about a bit later, um, and you really have to get there. So you're gonna have to run hard to make it there. Then maybe somewhere else on the course, you might wanna conserve some of your effort so you have the ability to get there. So knowing yourself and your abilities and your limits will allow you to help choose where to choose the techniques where you have to be in front and where you can choose to handle more from behind, for example. And one thing that Yanita talks about a lot in her mental training is you really want to avoid the feeling of being rushed. When you're calm, then you can focus on your job of connection and handling for the dog instead of thinking so much about, oh, where am I? Where's the dog? Where, where's the next obstacle? If that's sort of how you're feeling when you're running, you, you're going to miss the fact that you have a dog altogether and you'll end up handling the obstacles and not the dog and you'll lose that connection and that's when things fall apart. And then you end up feeling more rushed because you're not sure where the dog is and it all yeah, gets a bit messy. So try to choose techniques that allow you to feel calm in your mind. And that might mean sometimes you handle from behind where others are handling ahead and that's there's nothing wrong with that at all. If that's what your team needs to succeed, then that's what you do. And addressing any of those mental barriers. So uh, having trust in your dog, for example, let's say if you don't trust in a German turn that your dog will go to the backside independently, then the rest of the turn is not going to be good. Like you need to be able to trust your dog will go there so you can get off the line and move on to the next part of the course. But if you walk a course and go, oh, I'm not so sure that they're going to do that, then you're not going to give your dog the right information because you'll be managing everything. So then it's better to choose a different technique that you can trust your dog to perform um, well. And then as soon as you've done that, then you go home and you train that scenario and that technique in that scenario so that next time you can trust your dog. And it's really important to embrace your differences um, and get creative making your own signature. Like it's really fun to learn about your dog and your team and what you, um, what is really your like secret key ingredients that um, allow you to negotiate a course successfully. And every dog is so different. Like I've um, competed with six different dogs and each of them were completely different. At one point I was even competing with three different dogs at one time, like every weekend. And I'd have to walk the same course for three different dogs, three different ways, because I know that for that dog, this this works but for this dog that works and it um it really makes such a difference when you run a dog as an individual and not just oh you know my friend did this handling technique here so that must be the way to do the course because that's not the case and i i really don't like it sometimes when my students or other people are following and saying oh you're doing that there i'll do that too because then i'm thinking no because for your dog that's not the right choice there for my dog it is but for your dog it's not so you really need to just know your own dog and be confident in your own choices and that they support your dog and your team and not worry about what anybody else is doing. 
Let's talk a little bit now about lines and critical points of the course. So this is a bit more about assessing the course itself. So a critical point is that point of the course where you have to be to avoid getting disqualified. So let's say a backside jump that's not obvious for the dog. You have to be there to show the dog that it's the backside, otherwise you will get disqualified. So basically the first step when you're looking at a course is to recognize those critical points. So be like, yep, okay, there, there, and there, I have to be there or we will get disqualified. Once you've recognized those, then think about what you have to do to get there. So let's say I have to be on the right hand side here, or I have to be at least past the tunnel by the time my dog gets here. So think about those things. Then if you get to that point and you have options for getting there, so let's say in the previous few jumps, you can do a few things that will get you there at that time. That's when you can start considering your different handling choices. So quite often I will do those first two steps and be like, okay, that's my only choice. That's what I'm doing. Easy. Um, and then I don't even have to think about the rest. But then other times there will be times where I'm like, okay, I could be ahead here or I could be behind here. And then I start thinking. Then the next step is to choose the handling that makes it feel easy to get to those points. So if your first handling choice, you run it with your virtual dog. So the dog that you pretend that you have with you when you're walking the course and you run um, and you sort of feel what it feels like and you feel wrong afterwards, let's say you're in the wrong spot or you felt disorientated, then you would try another option. So um, I do have a video about this as well. So this was a course that we ran uh, two weeks ago and it was me and my dog Poe. And when I walked the course here, um, I had a choice, not in this bit, but a little bit further down. Yep, just here. So this line, I will reset this in a minute. This line, I had a choice to either do a Japanese, so running to the backside of the jump and doing a blind and going to the tunnel, um, or, so this is the blue um, jumps, or I had, well, sorry, they're all blue jumps. <laughs> so where I am now, three jumps back. Or I had the choice to send her ahead of me and do what's called a whiskey cross, which is handling the exact same line as the Japanese, but what, the Japanese I have to be ahead, the whiskey cross I can be behind. And when I walked the course, I thought, mm, I probably could get ahead, but there's a tunnel right behind that jump and probably loves tunnels. So if I am ahead and my timing is even very slightly late, she's in the tunnel and we get disqualified. So I went, okay, let's choose the safer option where I know I can get there to uh, be behind her and handle her with the whiskey cross from behind. And that's the option that we chose. So I will restart the video so you can see. So in the tunnel, this is a kabai. And now here I could get ahead, but instead I send her ahead of me and I do a whiskey cross. And this got us a clear round in first place in this course, which was awesome. Um, but I know that I probably could have gotten like 0.2 of a second faster if I had run ahead and done a Japanese. So even though that was the faster option, I went with the one that was a bit safer and I knew I could execute. Um, so this brings me to this point of sometimes you do have to choose a less than ideal line or side in order to make it to those critical points. So for me, that was a critical point because I knew that she would be looking at and thinking about that tunnel if my handling was not perfect and I didn't put her on the right lines. So there's no point in saving 0.2 seconds in one spot of the course if it leads to being disqualified somewhere else. So <laughs> unless you're like 100% confident of making it somewhere, choose the option that you know you can get there. Now let's talk a little bit about lines. So when dogs are looking at a course, they think ahead. They're a bit like football players. They're quite strategic and they think three or four obstacles ahead generally if they have good obstacle focus and they enjoy what they're doing. And they think and plan in straight lines because generally that's how they run, is straight lines. Um, and that's how they start out. So in this course, you can see these dotted or dashed lines. That's where your dog is, would naturally go if you were to do nothing. If you were to just run, that's where they naturally go. Any time that the line that you want the dog to take veers away from this natural line, you need to include that in your handling plan to some degree. And looking at this course from three to four, let's just say you will start running towards the left here. So basically up, um, up your screen or up my screen um, to guide your dog towards four. And you might do that just without even thinking about it. Yep, okay, when my dog looks at or is committed to three, I will turn my shoulders and I will start heading to the space between four and five, for example, to do a blind cross. So that movement is actually handling. You're using your motion to pull your dog off that natural line and onto this new line. So even though it's something you're doing subconsciously, if you start thinking about these things, you will start uh, being able to do these things more efficiently and think, okay, my dog might be looking, let's say you have a f super forward focused dog, they might want to go one, two, three, ten. And that would have been Poe when she was novice. She loved tunnels. My husband ran her for a long time and he basically taught her drive from tunnel to tunnel and I will show you the right things in between. 
So I know that she will be considering 10 and probably nine from the wrong side. So I might even do a rhythm change on three. So I'll slow down a little bit and turn to help her uh, focus on me and on the turn towards four. So it's really important to think about these dogs' natural lines and what they're naturally looking at and then handle um, in a way that you can change their line onto these correct lines. And as often as you can, you want to choose handling that will make the dog's natural line as close as possible to the ideal line wherever possible. So try to think sort of, if I turn this way, what's my dog seeing for the next four obstacles? And if the, what they see is what you is close to what you want them to do, that's the better choice. Um, because then your dog can smoothly continue on the course and they can focus on their job of performing obstacles while your job is to put the correct obstacles on your dog's line. And now I wanted to get down to the last point of the balance between speed and accuracy. So when should you ask for full speed? I know that it's very popular at the moment to run really fast and get as much speed out of the dog as you can and do lots of blinds, but you really need to consider when you should be asking for maximum speed. Can your dog still read the course easily and safely and accurately? Um, so dogs can actually lose confidence when handlers ask for maximum speed from the dog and then suddenly ask them to turn tightly. And we'll see this quite often in a blind where the handler does a blind and then asks the dog to suddenly decelerate and turn. Then the dog will actually start slowing down every time that they're asked for a blind just in case they get asked to turn. So they lose that confidence of blasting full speed. So if you choose to only handle and ask for speed at times when the dog is able to negotiate the course with speed, your dog will be much more confident on course. So that's a really important point to consider when you're walking a course. So on this one, if you look at the blue circle around number two, um, don't worry if you don't understand how some of these handling techniques work, but basically you could ask for a force front cross or a German turn, which both cue collection for the dog. That's all you need to know. They cue collection on that exit wing of two towards three as opposed to doing a Japanese where you would be queuing extension on two, because then that would make your dog look at 22. So it really depends on your dog. Like if you have a slower dog who um, is always running in deceleration, then yes, a Japanese would be a good choice there to get a little bit more out of them. But if you have a dog that looks at obstacles and likes to extend, then you could choose a technique that gives them more information about collection on the course. And same with on number 12, so the pink circle towards the right, um, on 11, 12, 13, you really need to be doing a front cross on 12 to tell your dog to collect and turn towards 13. Because if you try to do a blind cross here, you're queuing extension and the dog's natural line will take them to tunnel number seven backwards. Um, so they will have a much wider turn and they will again lose that confidence and possibly also be more likely to injure themselves in the long, long run if they're extending and then landing hard and trying to turn. So giving them the information that they need on the course to negotiate it safely and confidently is super important when you're choosing your techniques. And how fast should you yourself run? Well, how much do you want to run? <laughs> is one question. Um, sometimes, and there's nothing wrong with not wanting to run fast all the time. Like I don't enjoy sprinting hard. So I choose the handling where I don't have to run and I can th focus more on thinking and connecting with my dog. But then I have friends who love to run as fast as they can and they get a real adrenaline rush out of that. So they'll choose a technique where they can be fast and ahead. And again, both are totally fine. Sometimes handling from behind is more accurate if that's what gives you or your dog the feeling of not being rushed. So if handling from behind leaves you mentally calm and able to focus on what you're doing with the dog and connecting, then that would be my choice all the time. And I have a few students where I have basically said, okay, you have to walk while you're handling your course in this sequence because then it makes them mentally calm and they can really focus on what they're actually doing. And then when they have it all together, then, okay, now you can jog. Um, so basically getting rid of that feeling of being rushed and having to run everywhere. And I pointed this arrow at my dog Flo in this map because she is also a real um, point of this. So when I first started running with her, I was always pushing her for speed, trying to win, trying to go really fast. And she started developing um, early takeoff syndrome. So she would take off like way before the jump, jump really high and crash on top of the bar. And I, in my mind, I believe it is because she was feeling rushed and she was overthinking the spacing between the jumps and couldn't judge them properly and was doing these crazy jumps. So um, with some advice from Yanita, I slowed down a little bit myself and I started focusing more on connecting with her and giving her as much information about the line as possible and then letting her choose how fast she wanted to go with that information that I gave. Uh, and she stopped doing it and she actually got through Masters really quickly, got her Agility Championship, 
didn't knock bars anymore, just disappeared. And like at first I was like panicking, thinking, oh, it's a medical problem. She can't see, she's got problems with depth perception. But for her, it was just a feeling of panic and me rushing her. And when I stopped doing that immediately, the issue went away. So um, that was a huge relief and really taught me that it's not always important to get as much speed out of the dog all the time as, as you can. Um, so it's really important to consider that with your dog too. Like, are they maybe losing confidence because sometimes you've asked for them for too much? Um, so really think about the dog as well and not just about being the fastest all the time. And don't feel the need to run as fast as you can just because your dog is fast. Quite often when you have a really fast dog, if you also run fast, it can be a, a really crazy, crazy disastrous combination. So quite often it's better to run a little bit slower and from more distance and focus more on connection and timing and giving your dog that information. Um, some dogs are also highly aroused by handler movement and they can knock bars or they'll flank around obstacles, for example. And these, these types of dogs are often much calmer and more controlled when the handler moves less and just gives more information. So I want to leave you with the thought of understand all those tools in your toolbox and be really confident in your handling choices and then you will succeed. Um, I really hope that you enjoyed the webinar and if you have any questions about any of this or you have trouble understanding um, any of the tools at all uh, or how to apply them or where to apply them or even if you just have a course map and you're like what should I have done here please send them to us that's what we're here for so if you're on the one mind dogs uh, learning platform you'll see a little chat bubble where we pop up and go hi uh, that is actually us it's not a robot so <laughs> we are there um, so please feel free to send stuff there send a course map there send a sequence there send a video of your dog there and just tell us you know this is happening how what do I do here what could I have done better here and we'll be more than happy to help you out um, and one part of Agility Premium membership is that you can send in as many videos as you want and you will get feedback and we will tell you what works for you and your team um, and it will give you all of that. So I really hope that you've enjoyed it. Please let us know if you have any feedback or again any points um, for future webinars. Thanks guys. See you.